to the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. A very blessed and happy and joyous Palm Sunday to everybody. I'd like to go back in history a little bit. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 22. We see Abraham, Abraham saddling up his donkey and beginning a trip to Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son Isaac. And then we fast forward a little bit. We go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, and we see Saul. Saul, who is looking for his father's donkey, and he encounters the prophet Samuel, who anoints him as the new king. And later, through the joyous shouts of a loud crowd, the people recognize him as king. Let's fast forward a little bit. In 1 Kings chapter 1, we see Solomon. Solomon rides his own kingly coronation on a mule that had belonged to King David. They had Solomon ride on King David's mule and then took him to Gihon. Then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the horn and all the people said, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went after him and the people played flutes and they rejoiced with great joy and it said that the earth seemed like it split with their sound. And then we go to 2 Kings chapter 9, when Jehu, the first who first recognized his new king, each man hastened to take his garments, his clothes, and put it under, under him at the top of the steps. And they blew trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. And King Jehu rides over the garments of his followers as he proceeds to Samaria to destroy the temple of the false god Baal. These are different stories from different periods of Israel's history. At the time of the patriarchs, we see Abraham go to sacrifice Isaac. At the time of Judges, it draws close to a close, we see Samuel anointing Saul. When Israel was a single unified nation, we see the coronation of King Solomon. And when Israel was split in two, we see the coronation and the temple cleansing by King Jehu. In its own way, each one of these stories bring us to Palm Sunday. It points us forward to Christ in Palm Sunday. These are real stories. These events actually happened, yet they're bigger than that because they point to what is to come. They point forward to the coming of the Messiah and his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. As Abraham sits on a donkey traveling to Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, we think of Christ sitting on a donkey traveling to Golgotha to sacrifice himself. And according to Jewish tradition, Mount Moriah is Golgotha. They are the same. As Saul goes on a journey searching for a donkey, ultimately finding himself crowned as king, we think of Christ journeying on a donkey, hearing the crowds proclaiming him as king. As Solomon rides on a mule and hears the cheers and the, and the, of the crowd, and as he goes uh, to be anointed as king, we think of our Lord Jesus Christ riding on a donkey, hearing the cheers of the crowd while they hail him as king. As Jehu stands on the garments of his followers and is proclaimed as king, we think of our Lord Jesus Christ sitting and walking on the garments of his followers as he is proclaimed as king. As King Jehu rides into the city to eliminate Baal and the worshipers in the temple, we think of our Lord Jesus Christ riding into the city of Jerusalem to drive out the money changers of the temple, to cleanse the temple. Like Abraham, our Lord is a great leader, boldly riding to his destiny on a donkey as he goes to prepare the ultimate sacrifice. Like Saul, he says that our time without a king is coming to an end. It will not be a kingdom that is forced, but it will be a kingdom that is welcomed by people. If we read from the book of Revelations, this is a true fast forward. The book of Revelations chapter 7 verse 9, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, all tribes and peoples and tongues, 
standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands. As all the tribes and tongues gather around the throne of Christ, the throne of the Lamb, it says they were waving palm branches and proclaiming him as king. Like Solomon, our Lord Jesus Christ is the son of David, not reigning over a part of the kingdom, not reigning over half of the kingdom, but reigning over a unified people of God, reigning in wisdom. Like Jehu, who cleanses the pagan temple and eliminates the worship of Baal, our Lord cleanses our hearts from idolatry and ultimately, in the end, defeats all of idolatry. In heaven, there is only one religion. There will be only one form of worship, and it will be the worship of him as king and as God. So many streams, so many stories, and they all converge to one point. That point is the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of all time, the fulfillment of every hope, the fulfillment of every age. Whether you lived in the time of the patriarchs or the time of the judges or the time of the kings, whether you were Jew, whether you're Gentile, our Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of every hope of the human heart. He is the fulfillment of every single prophecy. Our Lord doesn't just pick out a couple of verses and say, yeah, there's some hints of that I was coming. No, when he speaks to the Jews in John chapter 5, verse 39, he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Our Lord is greater than Abraham. He is more beautiful than Saul. He is wiser than Solomon. And he is a greater conqueror than King Jehu. Throughout scripture, who do we see? We see the king, lowly and riding on a donkey. The great king who stands on the garments of his followers, who lay down their garments at his feet. We see crowds of people waving palm branches. Ultimately, where was this great king headed? Well, before the resurrection, there's the cross. Before glory, there is suffering. You see, just a few days from now, the Son of God is dead. He will be laid in a grave, and there will be mourning. And then Sunday morning comes, and we will participate with St. Mary Magdalene and St. John and St. Peter and those who go to the tomb of their Lord and they find it empty. Then Christ himself appears in their midst and they see the wounds in his hands and they see the wounds in his feet and they see the side of our Savior, Christ himself saying, peace be with you. Then he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. But before we talk about those things, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. I do want to reflect on the significance of today. Our Lord Jesus Christ rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. The one who can ride upon the chariots of fire, who is carried by a multitude of angels, rides on a humble, lowly donkey. When an emperor or a king would enter into a city after a great battle, they would come either on a horse, drawn chariot, or on a beautiful majestic horse. But the Lord, who will indeed be victorious, reminds us that his victory will not be through military might and power. It will be a victory through humility. We are constantly reminded that in the Christian life, the only way up is down. We rise, or rather, it's better said, we are raised to honor and glory through the willingness to put ourselves beneath others. 
to submit ourselves to others. It's a sentiment that's completely in contradiction to the messages of the world around us. Yesterday, we celebrated the raising of Lazarus from the dead after four days. And this miracle is directly related to the feast that we're celebrating today, Palm Sunday. Our Lord's entrance into Jerusalem. St. John, the evangelist, tells us that the reason why the people clamored to see Christ was because he had done this startling sign, this wonder. So people flocked in droves to see this man. Who might, who might be the Messiah, the Holy Anointed One, to see Lazarus, who also was raised from the dead. They also wanted to see him too. They came out by the hundreds, maybe thousands. And they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. They greeted the Lord as a victorious king. But what a great difference a few days can make. As we move into Holy Week, we quickly see that the cries of the people who came to greet our Lord on Palm Sunday they changed in less than five days he's betrayed in less than a week the same crowd that came to greet him and to call him king deny him and they cry out with one voice saying crucify him what's the meaning of Hosanna as we heard in the gospel reading, we remember that all the people are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is a term that we all should be familiar with. But what does it actually mean? If we translate it, it's an expression that means, save us, I pray. Or, I pray that you save us. I pray that you will save us. That's what Hosanna means. So, this was the cry of all the people following Christ. In essence, they're begging to be saved. They're calling him blessed. In terms of context, they had seen Christ raise Lazarus from the dead, and they were convinced that this Christ, this Jesus, something special. They all began to wonder within themselves and ask, is he the long-awaited Messiah? Can it be? And this is really important because in a lot of the Christian world, there is a disconnect before Palm Sunday. There is not that much of a recognition or acknowledgement of this miracle performed right before our Lord's entrance into Jerusalem. This miracle outdid all other miracles. This miracle caught the ear of people. Nearly every Jew in that area around that time, people are starting to hear what's going on. People are beginning to think that this is no ordinary preacher. This is not just a normal healer. This is not even just a prophet. His works proved him to be much more. And the people celebrated his arrival to the city as such. And then we quickly see how things can change. Our Lord, this feast today is a reminder that we are the people who cry Hosanna, and we are also the people who shall crucify him. We are both, at least I am. If I'm really being honest with myself, we're both. We are those who cry Hosanna whenever we are in need or we feel threatened. We feel like we're losing control of our lives. Oftentimes, unfortunately, this might be the only time that we pray. And we ask God to have mercy on us and to save us. And this we do out of the depths of our despair. But when the hard times pass, we forget. We forget God and all that he has done for us. And sometimes 
we have the opportunity to honor God in our lives and our work. We can credit him with our successes, but how often do we? Instead, we might credit ourselves, pat ourselves on the back. It was my hard work. It was my intelligence with anything that's good in our lives. It was me. We can honor God by living according to the teachings of Christ, but when we ignore those teachings and we go our way, my way is the equivalent of casting Christ to the side. Just as the people did when he was brought before Pontius Pilate. It's as if we're saying, what do we care what happens to this man as long as it doesn't crap my style, as long as I can live my own life? This is our reminder that we, I, am a sinful person that needs a redeemer. I need it. I don't know about you, but I know I do. These people cried out, Hosanna. And some of them meant it, but they turned away when it was no longer convenient to believe so boldly. Are we ashamed? Are we ashamed to speak to others about the name of Christ? Are we ashamed to pray before our meals and when other people are around us? Are we ashamed to share the teachings of Christ or the church for fear of what others might think? Are we ashamed? We probably think to ourselves, thank God I'm not like those people who betrayed Christ. But in fact, we are the same people. I am. We betray Christ every time we ignore his teachings and we do our will. We betray Christ when we sin. We betray Christ when we don't love our neighbor. We betray Christ when we dishonor and neglect the life that he gives us in the church, which is his body. We betray him when we ignore him, when we don't pray. We betray him when we don't give thanks for all the good that he has done in my life. We betray him especially when we choose to sin and not to obey his teaching as commandments. I pray that we're not like those people who celebrate the coming of Christ one day and betray him just a couple days after. We're not so different. We celebrate God when things are going well, but we might, we might, turn against him if our lives become uncomfortable, if we're sick, if people attack us, if people punish us because of our belief in him. Why were the people so fickle and moody? Why were their attitudes so quickly changed? It's because their faith was based on outward signs, not on the person of Christ. Our Lord displays his great love for us in this holiest of weeks because he hears both of our cries, both of Hosanna and our cry to crucify him. In his great love for mankind, he allows himself to be crucified when we are against him. Why? in order to do precisely what we begged him to do. We had cried out to be saved, and he didn't forget. And he will carry our cries of Osanna to the place where he can fulfill them. He loves us so much that he sets out to break the bonds of sin forever. And in breaking those bonds of sin, he truly answers our petition and he truly saves us. So in all of this, when Christ is going to the cross, he has not forgotten our cries for help. 
our cries for a savior. He will indeed answer these cries before the week is out. And then he will bow his head and say, it is finished. Just some concluding thoughts. On Palm Sunday, our Lord still allowed them to celebrate because although they didn't know it, they were celebrating their Savior. They were celebrating their freedom through this Savior. Little did they know that their celebration would indeed be fulfilled in his betrayal and in his suffering, in his crucifixion, in his death. These were the instruments of their salvation, of our salvation. They celebrated the raising of Lazarus from the dead, but in fact, the Lord was about to do something much greater by offering all of humanity a chance to partake in his resurrection. Our Lord is the fulfillment of everything that we see from Abraham, from Saul and Solomon and Jehu. He is the fulfillment of Psalm 118 when we read, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. He points us forward to the glorious waving of palm branches to King Jesus in the book of Revelation. I pray that this week we lay aside all earthly cares as much as possible. Allow things in our lives to come to a pause. Allow the life of the church to become the center of your lives as best as you can. This is our natural orientation as Christians. This is our week. This is our week to remember and to once again enter into our loving faith. This is the time to center ourselves in him, to find our healing and forgiveness through him. Today, we cry out Hosanna in the highest, for Christ defeated the powers of evil, and through his perfect sacrifice to the cross, we are truly liberated. Christ leads us to the unexpected victory in which the king, he lays down his own life for the salvation of everyone. Following Christ, we lay down our lives as he did for our brothers and our sisters, our neighbors, and even our enemies. Today, we cry out Hosanna in the highest as we follow our Lord to his passion and death on the cross and glory be to God forever. Amen. Today.